Hi there, and welcome to Starting a Counseling Practice Podcast. This is Miranda with Zinni Me, and we are all about helping connect you with awesome stories that inspire you and inform you about how to do private practice in a way that makes your life happy and your clients get great clinical outcomes. I cannot tell you how absolutely delighted I am that we have Tabitha Westbrook here today talking with us like this is... (laughs) Um, she has been here before. She's told other parts of her story, but it's time for an update um, as things shift in life and um, sh- things shift and change in our business. I think it's so um, powerful to go in and hear this is where things were and how things look used to look. Here's where things are now and where they're heading. Welcome to Abby. Thank you, Miranda. It's so good to be here. Do you want to share with everybody where you're located and um, your client, your uh, clinical specialty and your, uh, what is that called? Your URL domain. Yeah, absolutely. So I am located in Wake Forest, North Carolina. So it's just slightly above Raleigh. If you look at a map, um, I usually just tell people I'm from the Raleigh area because nobody knows where Wake Forest is, except those of us who live here. <laughs> Miranda knows. And me. Um, <laughs> and Miranda. Um, but I, we specialize in complex trauma. So the hottest of the hot messes. And we love to help people get out of the ditch and out of the darkness and into light. That's kind of our jam. And we hyper specialize in domestic abuse and the Christian church and helping um, folks, you know, get out of those relationships if that's what they want, deal with the aftermath of them, deal with the PTSD, and also work with churches to help protect survivors and their families and also call um, the abusers to accountability. So, and, and encourage them to change because obviously they need changes as well. So we, we do quite a bit with our local community and we love doing it. Um, our website is the journey and the process.com. So you got to spell out and no fancy symbols for us. Um, but that's how you can find us and find out more about us. Awesome. And just for people that haven't met you before in uh, one minute or less, why did you decide to become a counselor? Well, I've always felt like it was a calling on my life and um, people always told me their stories. Like I can find out everyone's life history just in the grocery store line. Like when we were allowed to go to the grocery store and be in lines like then. (laughs) Um, So I figured, well, you know, that is something that I really enjoy doing and I want to learn how to do it well. This is actually a second career for me. I uh, spent 22 years in clinical pharmaceuticals, um, upsetting people with my knowledge of legal regulations. And so I thought, well, I can handle hard things. So let's go do this. (laughs) Now, the amazing part, if you're watching the vlog, you know, this is that if you do the math and you look at her, you will, you'll be very confused because she does not look appropriately old enough. So it's always, but I am. Although I, I always I like every time young. I'm like, wait, how old are you? And then, oh crap, you, oh, all right. Okay. Then I always <laughs> forgot. Old enough to know better. <laughs> to That's know what better. I like to tell people. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Yeah. Most of the time. <laughs> um, okay. So tell people what year you started your private practice. I started my private practice in 2015. So awesome. I've been at this six years now. And what does your practice look like today? Oh my gosh, so different. Um, I have a group practice now and I didn't when I started, obviously. Um, So I have an intern that works with me and I have another clinician and I'm about to hire probably two more in the coming months, maybe three. We'll see. We'll see how it all goes. What has been your biggest um, learning curves when it comes, when it's come to expanding from a solo to a group practice, because you had a full private pay practice for a long mm-hmm. time with like a waiting list and couldn't even find the people to refer out to, mm-hmm. um, which I know I'm like fast forwarding the story in terms of that piece of like, you know, that was one of the big thing. I can't find people to refer these clients to like, it's such a specific niche. And like, what we do is like nothing mm-hmm. else. And so like expanding into a group just to meet the clinical demands of the people that were reaching out to you in in particular, like there wasn't another way to do that. Right. Mm -hmm. So I know you felt so called to do that. What were, what's been your biggest learning curves? 
I think the biggest learning curve is how much I can do in terms of clinical hours. I think that's been, you know, I kind of expected to just be continuing my caseload and it, and that doesn't work very well because you have to have time to actually meet with your staff and run a business and do all the things that go with running a business. And so I think that's been my greatest challenge and shift is how many clients do I need to have as a caseload and learning a bit more about that and what works better for me. And also learning, I was already in management in my past career. So I understood the people managing part um, fairly well, but also understanding like, how do I do it in this environment? Cause it's a little bit different. I mean, managing people is managing people, but learning like, how does that work? What kind of rhythms, what kind of information do I need to know if my clinicians are, you know, it, doing what they need to be doing and our clients are being well-served. And I'm very thankful. I have an amazing clinician. Like she's incredible. Um, so she's not hard to manage at all, which is awesome. Um, but just learning like, how do we do things? How do we scale up? How do we grow? Um, and what does that look like? And then how, when people call for me, how do I encourage them that like, yes, she is amazing. Like, I promise you, you need to see her because I don't hire horrible people. I hire amazing people. And since I can't see everybody that comes in, people do need to be willing to work with my clinician, which is awesome. And so learning how to steer that. Let's, let's talk about that for a second about how has it been, like what's been the emotional journey of not even just the steering, but like the saying no the saying no to this is the amount of people I can see on my caseload or saying no and hey here's a great clinician but what's it like to have to say no and know that like this is the amount of people I can see at first it was really tough um because you don't want to say no to people they're calling you obviously not on their best day right by the time they call you they're having a really hard time and because of what we specialize in, they have been through it. So they want, you know, maybe another therapist or a pastor or a friend said, you have to go see Tabitha. She's amazing. And for me to say, I so appreciate that, but I can't be your person. I need you to see somebody else. Cause I don't have the space. Like that's hard because you don't want to feel like you're letting someone down, but I'm over time, the more you do it, the easier it becomes. And also having confidence in my staff and what we offer and knowing that I hire good people, it's, it makes it easier to say, I promise you, like this person was handpicked by me and they are incredible and I don't hire not incredible and it, it's safe. And you know what, if you see them and you're like, I don't know, then we'll find you somebody that's a better fit because, you know, even if we were referred to, we're, we're not everybody's person and that's okay. You know, there's more than enough need and more than enough clinicians that are good that we can, you know, we can find good people, hopefully, that can help this person out. And and that has helped a lot. Just having the confidence to know, like, look, I really, you don't need me to be crispy. You need me to be a good clinician, right? Yes. So let me send you to someone who's really going to be able to have the bandwidth for you and can do amazing work with you. And every single client, because we do check in and you know, make sure that people are happy with their therapist. And every single client has said, we love our therapist. It's amazing. We're so glad. So, you know, I, the more that happens also, the more confident I become in saying no. Like I, I don't have the space. I think that's a thing that so many therapists right now are struggling with is that whether it's because of big caseloads or life stressors and these other things, like we have this incredible risk for being burned out. If you're burned out as a therapist, you're sort of normal. Like that's kind of the norm, especially right now. And we have to start taking ownership of what do we, what do we have to say no to so that we can do really great work with the people that are on our caseload? Like that we, that just saying yes and putting ourselves farther and farther into the hole is not doing this person any favors. Mm -mm. Like we cannot save the world. We cannot have these, you know, caseloads, whatever that looks like for you of, you know, 20, 30, 40. And in fact, sometimes like you're talking about 
I, I love the way that you um, <laughs> you described it, the hot messes of the hot messes or something that like, hey, we deal with like really intense trauma. That's mm-hmm. a different caseload than if you're working with like the, the, you know, the worried well who are just coming to like process through some stuff, but like their life mm-hmm. as well, you know, that's different than when you're seeing a caseload of domestic violence clients, like to be really honest about what kind of energy that takes and what kind of availability that takes, like that's important, like yeah. so powerful. And it sounds like you are teaching that to your employees as well in terms of finding that balance and, and knowing what a good caseload is for them. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I look really closely at how many clients my clinicians see you know, and we, with interns, we start them off slow because they're interns. And we are, as I like to tell them when I interview them in the deep end of the pond, doing the backstroke all the time, this is what we do. And so even if they're like, yeah, I definitely want to focus on trauma. When you do it for like eight hours, you're like, okay, that's a long day, right? So they have to do co-therapy with me. And then they slowly increase their caseload when, you know, as they get their sea legs as it were. And then for my other clinicians, it's how are you feeling? How are you doing? You know, when, where are you maxed out at? We talk about what the numbers need to be for them. For me, full-time is 20 um, for my clinicians. And if they, if we had a variety of very heavy cases, we would flex that. So if they're working with, you know, a number of really difficult things where maybe, you know, like some of the stuff we see is, you know, murders and, you know, family members committing suicide and plane crashes and all the things, right? And we work with first responders. So it's the heaviest of the heavy. And if they're like, man, like I am realizing I can't go above 18 or, you know, we're going to talk about that and figure that out because I want them to be their very best as well. You know, I, I want this to be an amazing place to work for people where they feel valued and cared for um, and supported in what they're doing. And so I know that different group practices have different numbers that they expect for their clinicians to carry. And I just tend to take a more flexible approach to it so that they're not getting burned out and they're not, you know, dreading coming to work. I want them to feel joy when they come in every time that they're going to see clients and see their ideal clients where they're just like, man, we vibe, we're doing good work. People are getting well. It's amazing. That's what I want. I love it. And right now, what has been your most important marketing strategy as you've expanded from that solo to group practice? I think the biggest things for us, Google, like, you know, the Googs has been real helpful. Um, People are finding us a lot that way. So having a really good website has been very beneficial. Having bios for all the staff members on the website has been really useful and helpful. Um, And then talking to people to let them know that we're here. So we have a close relationship with a domestic abuse ministry that um, works with survivors and has support groups. And so we tend to work together a lot. I do trainings, um, you know, for their, re- you know, their conferences and retreats and things um, and do a lot of survivor care. It's also one of the way th- ways that we give back um, to folks who maybe can't come to weekly therapy. We talk to pastors and churches and other providers and just let them know, hey, we're here and this is our, this is what we do. And this is our jam. And pastors in particular, are often really grateful. I think sometimes the church gets a bit of a bad rap because sometimes they mess it up a bit. <laughs> sometimes they don't do their best. <laughs> yeah. But sometimes it's truly pastors don't know what they don't know because yeah. in seminary, they don't get taught about this stuff, right? Mm-hmm. They get taught about like basic marriage counseling, which is kind of like, you know, take two verses and call me in the morning sometimes. Um, you know, whereas we have a different type of training that's more intense and, and especially dealing with, you know, abuse and coercive control. We, we see the signs or like, Hey, this isn't being said, but this is being said. Right. Mm-hmm. And so helping them understand that 
and see that they're so grateful. Oftentimes they're Mm -hmm. like, Oh my gosh, I didn't know that. And then I can connect them up with called to peace, which is the organization that we partner with a lot and say, Hey, why don't you get some advocates trained? Why don't you get some training? And then they can create their own program so that they have a good in-house like recognition. Mm -hmm. And then we partner together for the counseling piece. And I do the counseling piece you know, where my team does the counseling piece and, you know, works with the pastors. And we have had excellent success with that, mm-hmm. um, especially in the last couple of years. It's, it's been really heartening and exciting to see. Mm. It's such a, um, a powerful place, um, like to get in and start making systemic change, mm-hmm. right? Systemic change where it's like, oh, you know, from all of your years working with abuse survivors, that like you're working through all this trauma and one of the traumas often is the response they get from loved ones. And then sometimes the response they get from their place of worship. And it's just such a painful, like painful, painful experience. And sometimes can, can absolutely shatter their sense of spirituality can shatter their relationship with God as they know it. Um, and their relationship with people, their entire support network leave, you know, goes away because now they don't feel safe in this place. Like to be able to work at that from a systemic level where this person is getting good support within their community, the community knows how to come around them. Mm -hmm. Like how reparative from the very beginning, like how, like we're like inoculating against these additional levels of trauma that would Mm -hmm. sometimes take, you know, months, yeah. weeks to work through at minimum. Absolutely. Yeah. They, they, survivors have already been through enough mm-hmm. and, and they're trying to unravel the, the head junk the you know, the head trash that comes with it and they don't need any additional challenge, right? They need additional healing. They need love. They need support. And, you know, a good church community, a good community of any kind yeah. can help that incredibly. And, and often survivors have been so isolated from just any support and resource because it's all been hidden and scrolled away. And, you know, and folks who are abusive can be pretty sneaky. So, you know, helping them learn how to be in community and learn how to find safe friendships and relationships and, you know, all of those good things and, and helping them deal with now, what do I do? I've got to share custody with this scary person. Like, what do we do? And helping them walk through that and, and helping them be good parents. Like there's just a lot, a lot that can happen there. Now I have a question for you. Sometimes when we're working with outside agencies, and we're doing this additional work, in addition to the work we're doing in our practice, it can get really difficult to find the balance. Mm -hmm. How have you found the balance in terms of the give back and the building of the relationships to know like when you're overdoing it, when you're doing too many hours, when um, when you should charge for a training versus when you're gonna do something as a free consult, like how are you navigating that in terms of your give back? Sometimes it's hard. (laughs) <laughs> right. Cause we want to help. That's why we end up in this profession. Yeah. Um, but one of the ways that, that I think we have handled it and are handling it is setting ourselves a fair fee schedule. Um, mm-hmm. I know money is a little bit of a hard thing for therapists to talk about. And it's a real hard thing for Christian therapists to talk about sometimes. Um, Cause sometimes there's an expectation that your services will be free because you know, Jesus, <laughs> And that is not always a great idea. And also it, it really, it can devalue the work that we're doing, right? Mm -hmm. We went to school a lot and we do lots of CEs to stay really good at what we do. Mm -hmm. And there's a cost associated with that. And also people take their counseling and work more seriously when there's a cost associated. So setting a fair fee helps us not get overworked because we can pay our bills and also helps us, you know, ensure that like what we do is seen as valuable mm-hmm. and, and, to, and to give us a little bit of space so that we can have space and time for the give back without, you know, getting all burnt up and crispy. Um, yeah. But also, you know, letting folks know like, hey, this is a professional thing. Like you are coming to us because we are able to offer you a really professional service. Like you're not going to go to your cardiologist and be like, hey, I happen to know you go to church. Can you give me free things? Now I've heard from some (laughs) doctors that sometimes people get asked that, but like it's less likely with a physician and we are well-educated, well worth it. And honestly, 
in the long run, we cost so much less than other things. Yes. <laughs> so it's, you know, and also when people get healthier, they don't need our services, right? Our goal, I always tell people, I want you to get where you're going and then like wave goodbye and think of me at Christmas time, maybe send me a card. In fact, you don't even have to do that, <laughs> you know? And so we want to be, be a pit stop on the course of life or a check-in if they need it, but we're not there forever. So if, mm-hmm. you know, if they get a good value, then they're going to get better quicker. They're going to, we're going to do good work and then they, you know, ultimately spend less. So I, you know, again, money is a hard topic for therapists, but I think we have to charge something fair so that we can do what we do and do it really well. Yeah. It's huge. Now let's talk about this um, a little bit about this money. um, Cause I know a little bit more about your story probably than most people. And so I want to, and I know that when you were thinking about like expanding or, or even realizing that like, oh, I can't sustain the amount of clients that I'm seeing, your first thought wasn't, I'm gonna convert to private pay, get off low cost insurance plans and move into a group practice. That was not your first thought. What nope. were some of the other things <laughs> that you tried first to create a sustainable practice before? I mean, multiple jobs, just working longer hours. <laughs> All the things that are probably not the most helpful <laughs> right. out of all kinds of not very useful things, um, <laughs> you know, and I, and I kind of, and it was scary, right? Because like, is that something that I'm going to be good at, right? Am I going to go into a great practice and, and do it well, mm-hmm. you know? Um, so I thought of at least 700 other things that weren't group practice and, you know, as we kind of looked at them, it was like, well, that's just not the right choice. <laughs> that's just not a good idea. It's so, like, oh, if, multiple streams of income. Maybe I can do a passive income and I could do this other thing. Oh, wait, I actually don't have time to do a passive income. Because all cause, I do is work. Because all I do is work. Wait, like this isn't, like there's no time to do that. And I I can't say no to all these people. I feel this obligation to, yeah. to meet this community that I'm attracting with my marketing and my website but I can't fully serve. Like it was this kind of stuck place. Yeah. Um, and you kind of dipped your toe in the water a little bit with group practice. I did. Um, I, I, I always have had a heart for interns. One of the things that has been the most wonderful thing about both of the careers that I have enjoyed is someone took a chance on me. So when I initially went into clinical research 850,000 years ago, which is what it feels like now, um, you know, there were dinosaurs roaming the earth and whatever. Um, <laughs> I, the pterodactyls were so cool though. Like. They, they were great. They were rad. Um, they gave me a ride to work. No, <laughs> uh, but you know, I was, I was 20 years old and I was the biggest idiot on the planet. And I know that that's a judgmental statement, but I was not business savvy. Um, yeah, and- when I started in insurance, it was <laughs> I was like the the receptionist, and it was like bless your heart, like that's what I would have. Yeah. Like I was a great kid, but like bless my heart. <laughs> yeah, and and I was really blessed to be in a group that saw my potential mm-hmm. and took me under their wing, and even when I did some silly things that really upset people in the C suite, like CEO, COO, vice president, that those people occasionally I would ruffle their feathers. My mentor would like bring me in and she'd be like, okay, Tabitha, like that was not the best idea. And they would give me a chance to try again. And Mm -hmm. that was such a wonderful experience. And everything that I learned in that continued as I rose in that industry. And then when I moved over into counseling, I had the best supervisor who, you know, told me, she said, Tabitha, I understand that you're in a clinical mental health program, but you are an LMFT at heart. And she's like, have you looked at your electives? And I was like, well, yes, they're all family related. (laughs) And that actually led to me getting my dual licensure because I'm both an LCMHC and an LMFT um, because all of my electives happen to be marriage and family electives and I met the licensure requirements. And she said, you know, normally I don't take folks who aren't LMFT bound, but you really are. You just need to recognize about that about yourself. And she's been absolutely fabulous. She's Mm -hmm. been my mentor now for years. And so when, as I grew, I thought, you know, I want to give back. I've always been in sort of a training capacity. I did that in my last career. I want to help interns be amazing. And also I really want good counselors who know how to deal with domestic abuse that I can refer to in the future. 
So I took my first intern and it was so much fun. We have had a great time um, and, and it was just a really great experience to um, help somebody be their most amazing self. And I remember you telling me back in the day, Tabitha, that is a group practice. And I was like, no, it's not. <laughs> but I should know. Like, I now. don't want to do group practice. But yeah. <laughs> wait, this is semantics now. You have an employee, like you have a person. Yeah, in it your is practice. a group practice. <laughs> Let's like figure out the numbers of it. But like you have a group practice, what's going on? I yeah. think that's such a funny thing too. Sometimes we... Uh, we have to go and expand or do things in a way that, that makes sense for us. Mm -hmm. um, and that feels good, but it, it is sometimes interesting how we will get it in our head that things have to look this one certain way. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and that we're absolutely not ready to do that one thing. And then we look around and realize, Oh, I'm kind of doing, doing it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Oh and that goodness. was, you know, I think, it did give me confidence to go, maybe I do want to do this thing. In fact, my first hire was a person who was my intern for a year. Um, and she's fantastic. And she's an incredible clinician. And she's got an amazing skill set that is just so cool. Like she's kind of my resident artistic therapist. And so she brings these cool things in. And like, sometimes she's like, Hey, I found this cool art thing on Amazon. Can we get it? And I'm like, yes. Like, <laughs> I didn't even know that was a thing. Like, that's a thing. You can do that thing. Like she has expanded my horizons in a lot of ways, which has been just so much fun. Ah, oh, I love it. I love it. I love it. So tell us about, um, as we're kind of wrapping up, how many calls are you guys getting per month? How much space do you guys have? Are you hiring? What is what does life look like in your practice right now? So we get, it depends on the month. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, it can be anywhere from like, you know, 10 to 20 calls a month, which for a private pay, private practice, I feel like is pretty good. Mm -hmm. um, most people who call us, unless they were calling to use their insurance or something like that, um, will book with us. So we have a pretty decent conversion rate of folks that will decide to work with us, which is awesome. Um, I am hiring because my clinicians are full and I are full and I are trying to be less full. <laughs> <laughs> so we are hiring and hopefully we'll do that um, in the coming weeks and see how that goes, which I think it'll be pretty exciting to be able to offer more. And I've have met some incredible clinicians that I've interviewed that have really cool skill sets that are just really fun and, and just would really bless our clients. And so that I think will be the direction we go. So exciting. So, oh my goodness. I hope you guys were inspired by Tabitha today. I hope that if you are feeling crispy, that you take steps to start to feel better if you are excited about the idea of group practice, know that it is possible and plausible and that you can do it in a way that is fun and inspiring and profitable for everybody involved, including your employees. If you are someone who is just listening and you know, you're like, I don't even know, I just wanna learn more about counseling practice and maybe I wanna be an employee of a great group practice and you're in the Wake Forest area, go and check them out and uh, maybe <laughs> apply there. Um, and then of course I have the invite, uh, we have our marketing masterclass, um, happening now guys. So go and check that out, um, in the show notes or go to zinnime.com forward slash free, get some free CEUs and we'll teach you how to develop your really clear niche so that not only can you attract the people that are right for you, but also you can help to recover from or stave off burnout and be happy and balanced in private practice. Holy moly, that was a yeah. mouthful. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks again, Tabby, for being here. You're so welcome. <laughs>